Hi, this is Bruce McConnell with Locomotive Systems Training. Welcome back. Uh, as I've been talking for months and months now, it seems like, I promise you air brakes. Well, guess what, folks? Air brakes. Yay. The early years. This is LSTV-031. But I want to take a moment before I go into the air brakes and just really impress upon you again the importance of the role that the FRA plays in the railroad industry. Um, we went over some of the stuff that uh, that's important or that's regulation with the with the Federal Railroad Administration and and how they enforce it and and the reason why it is what it is. So anyway, a lot of good stuff. We're getting good reviews back, so we're going to keep on keeping on. All right, so let's talk about air brakes. All right, now I'm going to. I wrote this, but I'm going to read it because I, it's going to trigger me to make some additional comments. All right. So uh, back in the mid 1800s, the method used to slow or stop a train was very simple. When the engineer operating the train needed to slow or stop the train, he would blow on the whistle. Boop boop. Okay. And numerous people, depending on the length of the train, known as brakemen, would walk or run on running boards located on the center of the roof of the of the box cars turning handbrake wheels to apply the brakes on each car. Now, this picture is kind of cool because number one, it's a very snowy picture, okay? So envision you're up on top of that box car. Okay, we're gonna talk about the dynamic effects of what it means to be on that box car here in just a second. But uh, at best, it was a challenge, okay? So let's go ahead and go on to the next one. It says here, each handbrake wheel was connected through chains, rods, Levers and brake beams equipped with brake heads. Rotation of the handbrake wheel would move the brake shoe to make contact with the wheel. This contact created friction between the brake shoe and the wheel, provided retarding force to slow or stop the train. Now, I'm going to step over here for just a second. You'll notice that right here in this box car, early vintage, it has a handbrake wheel right here as a wheel, actual round wheel that the brake would either turn to the right to apply and turn to the left to release. Okay, there's the wheel that actually stood up there. On top of the car, and they're turning to, to turn the wheel to tighten it, and then also when the engineer gave the signal to release it. So that was uh, was strictly a mechanical brake application. I want to make sure you understand that because back then air brakes hadn't even been thought of yet. So the, each car had a mechanical handbrake, and again through chains, rods, levers, brake beams, it's all mechanical action is how they applied the brakes on the early steam locomotives. Okay. All right, now here's a really cool picture. Uh, number one, I think this guy probably a little bit on the cold side. Notice the, 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 we have the snow uh, on top of the car. We have icicles hanging off the side. Uh, and this guy's got his foot in a precarious situation right there. Uh, one slip, and I think it'd be all over for this guy. He's dressed fairly warm, but uh, as you can see, the running boards are covered with snow. So like I said, back in the day, that job was quite a challenge. So let's read about it. It says, imagine this, combine a forward motion, the train's moving forward, and then let's say it is in the middle of winter somewhere in America. Voila, okay? The walking surface on top of each car is covered in snow and ice. Add into the mix a rocking motion, side to side. So I'm going forward, and the car is also going side to side uh, of each car, and you have, at best, a dangerous condition and at worst a treacherous or deadly condition so here you are you're on top of this car you have the wind chill to consider you have the snow you have the ice running boards are all covered in snow and ice you have the forward motion of the train you have the side to side motion of the train uh, hopefully this guy has good sea legs because he's gonna he's gonna need them to apply all these handbrakes on on every car that he's assigned to Wow okay let's go to the next one and now, as you can see from this picture, I've got a couple of guys up here. And again, we got snowy, icy running boards on every car. And it's snowing pretty good, so the visibility is poor. Uh, the windshield, again, that can't be fun. The forward motion, the rocking, everything all adds up. So now, the engineer needs the brakes to be released because he slowed down, made the turn, or whatever the case may be. Uh, in this wintry storm, he once again gives a different signal or command, an air signal off the horn, to release the brakes. The brakeman walk or run, hence a running board, to release the brakes that were previously applied. So that's what they got to do to apply them. Go back one if you would. So there he is applying them, and then go to the next one where we were. Now they got to run on top of each car and knock out what they call knock off or release the brakes on every car that they're assigned to. So that was the braking system of early, early steam days. 
Let's go to the next one. Now, in addition to everything that I just mentioned, the conditions they're working in, now I'll add in things like locomotive smoke. I don't think I passed smog today, but you get my drift. Locomotive smoke. Tunnels. That's going to leave a mark if you don't know where the tunnels are and you don't duck or get off the top of the car. Trees, high winds, rain, lightning. <laughs> That's a doozy. Uh, dust storms and every other environmental condition known to man. It became clear to the railroad industry that a better method of braking was needed. So um, being a brakeman back in steam days was a really, really, really tough job to have. Uh, and it was very important. So here's what the railroad industry did. In the, last half, in the last half of that century, companies began to invent very simple air brake system. This served two purposes. Number one, the most important reason, it got the brakeman off the top of the boxcars. That was so key point, it wasn't even funny. Uh, and it says right here, this saved countless injuries and deaths. Major improvement, just by doing that alone. Uh, number two, provided better control of the train. However, let's go to the next one. Oh, back it up one. Before I go to however, the, nope, right there, perfect. You'll notice we have a, a drawing here. Uh, straight air brakes, automatic air brakes, electric brakes, and others. Okay, this was an early version of this, what they call the straight air system. And in the straight air brake system of steam locomotives, they had three components. Number one, they had a main reservoir or a great big air tank that came off of the steam-driven air compressor. So you have a big steam, we have a big air tank, then you have this valve, this control valve, and it was either open or it was closed. Nothing, very simple, open, closed, okay? Then the third thing was that uh, that pipe went down to a brake cylinder or brake cylinders, and that applied to release the brakes. Now, it says here, however, so let's take a look at that. All right, so early air brake systems had numerous problems. Number one, the air brake system limited early steam trains to only about six pieces of rolling stock. This, three of the six pieces of the rolling stock were the locomotive, the tender, and the caboose. They only left you three, three rolling stock of box cars, flat cars, whatever, as revenue source. In other words, the locomotive, the tender, and the caboose, you're not going to put lumber or oil or cars or anything else on that equipment. That's a non-revenue vehicle. But box cars, flat cars, tank cars, those are, what we air quote, revenue vehicles. Those are the guys you're going to make your money with. Now, I got this little picture just to kind of show you a little bit. I'm missing a caboose. I'll tell you that right now, just that way you don't have to beat me to it. But this is your atypical train back in the day. You had a locomotive, tender, one, two, three cars, and at the end you had a caboose. That was your normal train in the early steam days. Okay? Uh, so these are the problems. The number two, the braking applications were non-uniform. In other words, they did not have a standard brake application. Some were high and some were low. Okay? So let me talk about that for a minute. You got this great big tank, or this tank on the locomotive that's being pressurized by the, the, air, the steam driven air compressor. So the air comes in, flows to the tank, comes out of the tank, goes up to the valve, valve opens, the go, air goes from the tank, from the valve, down to the brake cylinders and the brake supply. Okay? Now, the fact that it was non standard was a problem because if the air in that tank or main reservoir was at a high pressure, we had a good braking application. If it, was, if it had about a medium pressure in there, you had about a medium brake application. If you had low pressure in that tank, you had either low or no application pressure. So it was non-uniform. Okay? Uh, and the, depending on where that engineer moved that handle determined how much brake he had. Okay? So that was the problem early on. The, 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 uh, the third thing was, in the event of loss of air pressure, like a, like a burst hose or a, a, a knuckle broke, I had a train separation, all the, all the brake pipe, and that's what they called it back in the days, or train line brake pipe, all that air exhausted the atmosphere. And as a result, there was no air supply available to stop the train. So now, you've got to get a runaway train, or you're going to have a runaway train, which will lead to a, to a derailment. These were things that the... That the uh, uh, air brake industry builders had to overcome early on uh, as the, the building of this or the evolution of this braking system began. Okay? All right. Okay. So now, through refinement and improvements in the design of the air brake equipment, we now zoom ahead. We zoom ahead to the year 2015. That's where we are here right now. In 2015, locomotives usually are equipped with three types of brake equipment. 
One, an automatic brakes, which is this black handle right here. I always teach when I teach these air brake classes. Do not go by the color of the handle. Go by the, where the position of that handle is on what type of equipment. This upper piece of this equipment is called the 26C brake valve, automatic brake valve. The automatic brakes, though, apply the brakes on the locomotives and the cars. In other words, when I move this handle into the braking position, I don't apply the brakes on the lead locomotive. I apply them to the last 150th car in that train. That's automatic brakes. Independent brakes, uh, usually, usually, and I'm going to tell you this, but don't rely on it, have a red handle or a plastic handle. Okay. Again, never go by color to identify a brake type, a brake type. never ever. Because as soon as you do, they're gonna change the color and you go, what? Always go by the actual position of the brake equipment mounted in that control stand. The top one is automatic, the little bit one down below it is the independent brake valve. That will be locomotives only. And dynamic braking, which will be a lever right in here, that will be for electrical brakes when you're going down the hill, you're actually using the traction motors to slow or retard your speed back. Again, electrical brakes, locomotives only, and again, that's an option that the railroads buy from the builders of this equipment. All right, so, you know, a lot of new changes. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so let's refine this previous statement. There are two types of air brake systems. There are pneumatic air brakes, which is what we have as picture here, okay? Uh, and there are electronic air brakes computer, which I don't have right here. Each locomotive will have one type or, uh, hold on, each locomotive will have one type of braking system. If it will be either pneumatic or electronic, not both. So it's either going to be pneumatic like this or be electronic modules in lieu of this or in place of this. Okay. Uh, new model locomotives are usually ordered in two different configurations. Electronic air brakes equipped with dynamic braking or pneumatic air brakes equipped with dynamic braking. Those are usually your choices. Um, there's different manufacturers of electronic air brakes and uh, all the difference between the two of them is one's controlled by a computer, the electronic air brakes, and the pneumatic brakes are controlled by handle movement, by a mechanical action. So this is where we're going to stop right now because number one, this is, this is the end obviously, um, but what I want to do is explain to you, we're going to start talking about some components here a little bit. So this, all this makes a little bit more sense, okay? Again, go to our website, check it all out. That's uh, lst-ca.com. Once again, that's lst-ca.com. Thanks for, for checking in. Hope you learned some cool stuff, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.